Good evening and welcome everyone. Welcome to the 20th show of Hathor Hosts. I mean, I can't believe it. I cannot believe that I have done 20 shows. Hi Claire. <laughs> um, goodness me, to those of you who have been here from the very, very start, who've watched every week, uh, thank you so much for your continued support. Uh, for your love and everything. I am so excited about tonight's guest. I see she's joined the conversation. Um, Lisa, you need to send me a request, otherwise uh, or otherwise, I'll join you in a second. But um, I just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone who's kind of joined me right from the start, who has supported the show with your artwork, your tweets, your Instagrams, the posters, the photos. It just, it really means so much to me and uh, I'm really, really chuffed. Um, I also wanted to say, just at the top of this interview, because uh, I know a lot of people who watch the YouTube channel are big into Stargate, this is not a Stargate actor, but you will be wowed nevertheless. Uh, so I'm going to try and see if I can start with Lisa, because I can't seem to, there we go. Let's, I'll have to send her a request. Um, I've sent her a request to you, so hopefully you should get that and just accept it now, she's saying. <laughs> um, Otherwise, there should be something you should have been asked. Leave the conversation, Lisa, and then come back. You should have been asked to uh, appear in this video. Um, okay, hang on one second. Bring it now. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Well, that was a bit of fun, of course. Um, Yay! <laughs> this is always the worst part. <laughs> How are you, my beautiful? I'm much better now than I, than I, I was like, how do I do that? <laughs> you told me you knew how to do it. Yeah, I thought I did because I thought it would come up on my screen. Anyway, here we are. We're good. <laughs> exactly. And welcome to Hathor Hosts. And thank you so, so much for doing this. Thank you. I'm so excited. I'm so chuffed. And it's your anniversary. It's so exciting. Yes. 20th. So that's why I've got the sparkles on tonight. And glammed up just for you for a disney queen <laughs> well i thought i better i thought i better match you so i've done oh no you're frozen there i'm there you back. Are, you're back yes um for the future because this has been happening quite a bit and at the moment uh anyone who's not watching in the uk we are having unbelievable storms so there is a good chance that things might uh get a bit um, testy, shall we say. If that happens, just click the little cross to end the conversation and then rejoin or I'll get you back on. Okay. Um, okay. Sometimes the sound seems, the picture freezes and the sound still works, but otherwise it can all just go tits up in a big way. <laughs> anyway, oh. it's not going to. I feel we're gonna have the power of Disney in our corner. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to welcome you. We're gonna jump straight on in. Uh, where were you born, lovely Lisa? So I was born in a, a little town called Tromsø, which is above the Arctic Circle in Norway. So properly frozen, you might say. <laughs> yes, I mean, the real life kind of inspiration. You lived it. And yeah. do, you have, do you have any siblings? Yes, I do. I have an older sister called Monica and I have a little sister called Ryla, and they both live in the United States. So we're quite spread apart because my mum is actually American. Um, and my father studied there. So that's how all of this came about. I see. That explains some things. <laughs> <laughs> and is it true that when you were younger, you would entertain your neighbours? You would put on concerts, any opportunity to sing and entertain them? Yes, it is true. The rumours are true. Uh, we would actually charge my neighbours money <laughs> And Good girl. to come, you're very entrepreneurial. We would, and I was the instigator, of course. So we would charge my neighbors money. We would make them come, make them pay, and then make them sit through a really terrible show where we would do things like um, the, the, the Tower of Pisa, where I would stand on someone else's back and that would be the Tower of Pisa, for example. Like, it was terrible. <laughs> but we did it and we made money and then we went and bought candy. So very very clever kids obviously we That's, were <laughs> yes indeed and showcasing your skills from an early age <laughs> indeed do you come from an artistic family well my mom is very artistic she um has always 
uh, been painting. She's, she's an amazing artist. Um, so I grew up with, with that. I am terrible at art for some reason. I have no idea how. Um, but, but she's very artistic and she used to, to sing to me uh, always lullabies. And I think she really fostered that love of music because my dad, bless him, he, he enjoyed music very much. Uh, but he he couldn't sing at all. He was tone deaf, and uh, yeah, he he was not um, artistic in that way. But to be fair, he was also artistic in his own way. He took he took beautiful photographs, uh, even though that wasn't his job. But he was right. yeah. So I guess so. So creative was always there. And and when was it that your family or you discovered that you really could sing that you had this extraordinary voice? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, it's true. Um, <laughs> well, I think when I was little, I really have a very strong memory of, thank you, Nala. Uh, I have a very strong memory of being in the former Yugoslavia. Um, it's obviously different, lots of different countries now, but I can't remember what it is now. Um, but we were at a national uh, dance sort of um, no, well, we were in a restaurant and there was a, a fiddler and an accordion player who were, who were playing up to the dinner. And I just got up and started dancing and singing along and, uh, and people started to clap for me. And that was kind of, that was kind of, I remember that so strongly and I can't have been more than three or four years old, but that was really the start of, I was like, ooh, if I do that, they clap for me. <laughs> this is great. And what was your mum's reaction to that? Did she sort of kind of go, oh my God, she, she can really sing? Or did they, yeah. were they, they surprised? Used to, they used to joke that they should have, you know, brought out the hats and collected money because <laughs> uh, they would have been rich, come out of there. Um, but yeah, I just started to sing very early uh, as a child and yeah, just was never still really, you might say. I was yeah. like, a, like a wind up bunny. <laughs> I thought I thought you were going to say more than that. <laughs> um, I know. I just, <laughs> I just wanted to say, anyone who's joining us for the first time, um, sort of the way that uh, I've conducted my interviews in the past is because I see somebody's asked if you'll sing into the unknown, which I'm sure you'll grace us with, um, hopefully at the end of the interview. Uh, but usually, if, if it's okay with everyone, because we've only got an hour and we have to kind of get a lot done. Um, so hopefully we'll try and get to that at the end, just in case you, you think I'm not seeing the, the questions or, or getting to it. Um, so then at 18 years old, you entered Norway's biggest televised show. Uh, I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation. Talentiaden. Very good. Excellent. Oh, tuck, tuck. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> and this obviously gave you massive exposure instantly, as TV does. Um, and you got down to the finals. Uh, and then what happened? You ended up getting... Oh, yeah, it was, it was pretty dramatic. So, um, so it was the biggest live TV show in Norway at the time. We had, back then, Norway had less than 5 million people and a million people watched the show. So it was a, wow. you know, a fifth of Norway's population at the time were, were watching it live. And it was the finale. And the winner was going to sing at the Olympics, which were happening in Lillehammer. This was in 1994. And, um, and I was going to sing New York, New York. And I had choreography and I had a hat and I had, a, a, you know, it was all going to be super fun. And as the week went along and we were rehearsing and they were recording at rehearsals, my voice got more and more um, damaged. And by the, by the, final by the actual day I literally woke up and there wasn't a sound I couldn't even talk there was nothing coming out of my mouth I can't even tell you it was yeah it was like a nightmare I had worked so hard for this mm. and um they were all panicking in the tv station uh because they had kind of you know they had big goals for me um and uh, they even offered me to use my playback from my rehearsal mm -hmm. and kind of, uh, you know, mime over it. Um, and, I, and I remember I was just like, absolutely not. I can't do that. Imagine if I win, what's gonna happen to me because yeah. I'll be absolutely crucified. Um, and, and that was my decision and I remember that. 
uh, really, really well um, that I just said, I, I can't do that. If, if I'm going to do this, I'll do it with my whole heart and do as best as I can. And that, that's going to have to be it. And, um, and I did. And so if you, if you ever watch it, if you turn off the sound, you can't tell that anything is wrong. So if you <laughs> switch on the sound every time I come to a it sounds very sexy in the beginning because I had no voice so yeah. once I start getting to the top notes there's like no sound that comes out of my mouth I open my mouth and there's nothing um but the guy who won uh he he, he, he was extraordinary and I I really think he would have won anyway yeah um, he was called Jan van Danielsen he was a dear friend of mine and he very tragically passed away terribly young um and we got the pleasure of working together um later in life um and he was yeah it was just a tragedy he was a, an amazing amazing performer and i i really think he would have done enormous things had he had he stayed alive so so i was you know happy that it was him you know i was mm. really happy that he was the one who won and he he deserved it. So it, it all happened how it's supposed to happen. It was an amazing experience. Exactly. I, came not third. I came third with no voice. <laughs> Which is extraordinary. And Absolutely. you still, I think it probably was one of those things that taught you very early on that show business is not always, uh, it's not a predictable thing. And our voices, it's, it's an instrument and it's a you know, muscle and... You, you only have what you have on the day, you know, and yeah. you were probably, okay. you, you didn't know any better. So well done for powering through and, and for making such an impression because it really did. You made a huge impression on, on everyone in Norway. Um, and then you did something sort of slightly, I think, sort of curious. You decided that you were going to up and leave and study in the UK, but in Liverpool. Like, <laughs> what prompted that? Well, what prompted it was actually a uh, classic um, me, which was that I had missed all of the application dates for the UK schools, which were currently at that time in London. Mm -hmm. um, and I had always wanted to work abroad. I had never, I love my country. And ironically, I work when, not at this time, but normally I work there a lot. I have a lot of work there and I know we'll talk about that a bit later, but um I had always big, big, big dreams and big goals, even though I came from this tiny town, you know, where everyone thought that's ridiculous. You know, who do she think she is? Uh, but I was <laughs> you showed them now. <laughs> yeah. But they're, they're very proud of me now. So it's very sweet. But I was very audacious. And I, and I thought, you know, I need to get out of here. I need to go out and spread my wings and learn. British theatre, I've always known that that is it's the cream, you know, it's the, the creme de la creme of theatre is in the UK. And, um, and I had missed all the application dates for London. And then by some miracle, the, there was a newspaper article. And I think my parents called me about it. And they said, you have to read this. Paul McCartney is opening a new university in Liverpool. And they're starting next year. Uh, and I was like, that's it this is a sign, I have to do it. So <laughs> I applied and, and I just, I, I remember coming out of that audition and just having such a strong feeling that this was gonna happen, that I had yeah. done it. And, and we were the first year, so it was really, really very special. We got to meet Paul McCartney, we got to meet, you know, the Queen came to our opening day. Um, wow. Yeah, it was just, it was, I think our year was so lucky because we were the first. Um, it gave us a lot of attention from casting directors, from agents in London. They were all curious to see what were these young upstarts going to do. So, yeah, it was it was a very special time. And I, I love Liverpool. I have such fond memories. Um, and I'm very glad that it worked out in this way. It all worked out yeah. really well. And was drama school a happy experience for you? Happy yeah, time. it was. It was for most of the time. I could have made better boyfriend decisions, but you know, <laughs> apart from that, my actual usually was great, and I have lifelong friends. Um, and I think what was so unique for us was that because we were the first year, no one really knew anything. Even the teachers were learning really, and it wasn't a very structured environment, which suits me very well. I'm not 
great if there are too many rules. So at the moment, it's a bit tough. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but um, I love my freedom. And, um, but it was a wonderful place to explore. We were really given a lot of freedom yeah. uh, because no one knew any better. So we just kind of winged everything and we got to try things, which I'm not sure if people studied now, they would get to be quite so bold and, and quite so, um, I don't know, original and off the wall. So it was, yeah, it was a brilliant time. And it was a real um, wake up call to the world as well, coming from my very protected, sweet little, you know, environment in Tromsø where I'd never, I had never experienced, you know, anything bad or anything like that. And then I came to Liverpool and on the first day, there was like a police raid outside my house and <laughs> there were 12 police cars, police helicopters. I mean, it was nuts. Yeah. So that was, uh, yeah, I learned a lot, learned a lot in Liverpool, not just acting. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's always, you know, drama school is a good life lesson. It's a way of growing up and, you know, getting you into, uh, in introducing us into the world um, and learning a lot about yourself. Well, sure. you clearly did very well there because you graduated with honours. Uh, and then four months after graduating, you booked a job. You didn't start rehearsals right away, but you booked a job that changed your life. And I am, of course, talking about Mamma Mia, because you originated the role of Sophie in Mamma Mia worldwide. Yeah. <laughs> so how did that audition come your way? Oh, it's actually quite funny because I had, so I had, like most people at a drum school, I was working as a waitress. And um, it's like, you have to do that. Did yeah. you do that? Oh yeah. Oh my God. Did we I all got to be a waitress. Um, yeah. And I had an audition for Starlight Express, which is in fact, one of my favorite ever shows. And the first show I ever watched in England. Right. As a child. And, um, and I, I did this audition and I was so bad at my dancing for that show because I'm not a very funky dancer. I'm more of a classically trained dancer. Mover. <laughs> I'm a mover. I'm a mover. I can move. Yes. Um, <laughs> but this was like full on body popping and re like just way above my skill set. And the choreographer was almost laughing at me in my audition. <laughs> and then luckily the casting director when I sang and I knew I said, I, I know that I did that singing audition very well. Um, and he was like, Hmm, I wonder. And he was the casting director for Mamma Mia. Ah, okay. And that is how that came about. So then I thought, obviously being new from drama school, there's always kind of a expectation that you do ensemble, like you work your way through yes. the chorus and then eventually you end up maybe as a supporting role if you're very, very lucky. And then, you know, in a few years time, you might get to be a lead once you've paid your dues. Well, as the audition process went along, um, I just had this, I just had really good vibes from the room. And you know this, when we audition, we know, like we yeah. know if we, have rapport we know if we've you know nailed it we know for ourselves well, you can always feel it mm -hmm. and um and there was one point towards the end where the pianist called pete i will love him forever he came out and he he said to me they love you keep going just keep doing oh, what you do they love you pete <laughs> i know i don't like oh my gosh um <laughs> and in fact my flatmate at the time from lipa Andrew Langtree, he um, was auditioning for Sky in one of my auditions. So we got to audition together, which was yeah. super fun. And of course we knew each other really well. So it was so easy. We lived together at the yeah. time, um, but he wasn't my boyfriend. We were just sharing a flat. Um, but, but in my actual audition, my final audition, which How was- How many did eight, you have? Eight. Eight. Wow. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty nuts. Um, and I was still, I was still of the mindset that, you know, I'll be ensemble or if I'm lucky, I might be her cover. Yeah. And at the final audition, which we knew was the final, we'd been told this was the final day. We were at the Adelphi theater and I was like fangirling all over the place because there was Uta Lempa's door. There was, um, 
Oh, Uta Lemperin, uh, help me. Who played it? So Chicago, right? So yes. Ruthie Henshaw? Yes, Ruthie. Yes. So Ruthie Henshaw with her star and Uta Lemperin, look at you go. Uh, Uta Lemperin and Ruthie Henshaw with their stars on their doors. And I was like, oh my God. And, um, and I did my audition, but then there was this guy who really did not nail his audition. And we had to audition together, a guy and Sophie, and I thought, oh my gosh this is i haven't got it like this is ruining my audition and uh and i was so worried and then afterwards Phila Lloyd, the director came up to me and she went i see you soon oh, and I was like, oh, oh my god i have it uh but i yeah i was like is this a sign what does this mean um but yeah so, so where were you when you officially heard was that it or did they must have given you an official Cool. Yeah. So then I was doing my waitressing job one day and my agent called and he said, you have to come into the office. And I was like, I can't, I'm at work. And he said, you have to come to the office. And I was like, okay. So I went up there and I was like, what's going on? And they went, you got the role of Sophie. <laughs> and, so, sorry, what? And, and they said it again. And I was like, no, this can't, this, that can't be true. And I actually didn't believe them. I actually made them call Dave Grinrod to tell me himself on the phone. He was the casting director. So, <laughs> so when he told me, I did believe him and we opened champagne and I still have the cork actually. Oh. Key piece in there. And yeah, it was amazing. That's Just amazing. amazing. Yeah, my, my final, I think was six uh, for, for Mamma Mia, six rounds, which is also it's terrifying because it's a lot. And also when you're in the first, two rounds you kind of go well if it doesn't happen this time i'll come back next year or i'll try again every time you get closer that desire to do it gets bigger and that's a difficult thing to to kind of tame um so there you were in rehearsals how long was the rehearsal process two months eight weeks wow and did you guys uh workshop a lot at that stage or was it yeah. already quite defined no, what people don't know is that, oh my gosh, did we work on that show. Uh, when it started, it was more like a drama. And in fact, we had loads of songs. Like me and Sky had many more scenes. We had, there was a song called Kisses of Fire, which I actually love. I think it's a great song. Um, Kisses of Fire was cancelled. And then we had a really, it's a lovely song, but it was a terrible number called Just Like That. Uh, we also opened the show in the past with Summer Night City. We opened the show with Summer Night City for the first two weeks of our um, previews. And it was literally, I think, like the day before the premiere or something like that, where it switched to I Have a Dream. Wow, that's yeah, it was a, It was pretty scary. <laughs> yeah, big adjustments to make, like on the kind of turn of a, a dime. Um, yeah. Were Benny and Bjorn very involved in the rehearsal process? Bjorn was very involved. He would come in regularly and, um, and I mean, we worked quite closely, I would say, with Bjorn for sure. Um, uh, Benny came in towards the end and, and because we, we, by now, we were like, yeah, Bjorn, we were so besties with Bjorn because he was there all the time. <laughs> uh, and then when Benny came in, it was really quite we were all quite moved by it also because he's terrified of flying so for him to fly to the uk was really you know it's a big deal yeah um and he came to our sits probe it's called it's when um the actors and the musicians and you play the piece with the orchestra for the first time and it's always my favorite thing isn't it yours i bet yeah. it's yours as well. the sits yeah. probe is always my favorite thing but this was my first sits probe um, and I remember seeing Benny sit there with tears rolling down his cheeks, listening to us sing. Honestly, it was like, I can't even think about it. It was so moving. And he came up to me after the, after the um, sits probe and he, he said, you have a real Scandinavian, he said, you have a very Norwegian purity to your voice. He said, don't lose it. Don't ever change it. And I've always yeah. remembered that. And I've always kept that in my heart um, because in musical theater, you know, you're supposed to have very big vibrato, it's supposed to be very large. And so I've always remembered that, that Benny gave me that advice. And I think, well, it is Benny Anderson, so I better listen. 
He's, he does know a thing or two about uh, he does know about a thing or two about, about music. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the opening night, do you remember like the reaction? So you finish the the curtain call, uh, and oh, sorry, I've got fluff floating around the house. Um, uh, and the curtain comes down, and people just did they go nuts? Yeah, people went nuts, and yeah. we were not expecting it, and also people were laughing uh and in fact we had you know we had gone from being a drama to a comedy through the previews so we had rewrites every single day we had rewrites we had rewrites on the numbers we had rewrites on the text i mean it was it was not it was a really collaborative process mm -hmm. um and so on opening night when all of this had happened and we'd made these big changes and people were laughing their heads off during the show and singing along and stuff. Um, yeah, it was just, I can't even describe it. It was so extraordinary and not like any musical theater experience I'd even had as an audience member in that way. It was really yeah. unusual. And afterwards, I mean, I was convinced that the critics were just gonna tear us apart because there wasn't a show like us at the time. Everything was very serious, you know, Lemus Rabel, was still playing, um, uh, Phantom of the Opera was still playing. Everything was quite heavy. The only other light thing that was there was Saturday Night Fever at the time, if I remember correctly. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was amazing when those critics, you know, came in and they, they were like, I want to hate it, but I can't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was literally kind of what everyone was saying was like, I don't want to like it, but I can't help myself. Yeah. Like, so you know what, I, what, what I remember from my opening night, um, because obviously by the time I did Mamma Mia, the show had been running, I think, 12 years. So right. it was, you know, it's a machine. It's the most wonderful environment to work in. They're the most incredible people. I was so honored to go back last year or the year before, whenever it was for the 20th anniversary. It was um, amazing. But, and people prepare you. Everyone's like, you know, they're going to go nuts at the end of the night. You're going to get to Waterloo and people are going to go crazy. And I was like, I mean, okay. You know, I was just kind of like, just get through everything properly. And we finished the show. And as you said, like, it's almost, it is the, it's the, probably the closest I'll ever get to being a rock star. Yeah. Because there is like a wave that just goes down from the gods, right? And you feel it washes right over you. It's like, wah. And people just smiling and happy. And it was the most joyous experience and, and fantastic show to work on. Um, it's, such a, it's such a joy to bring joy to people. I mean, I think, uh, I think it's such an under, like, it's almost like it's underrated, the fact that it's comedy, the fact that it's lighthearted. Yeah. Uh, but it, it was, I used to sometimes get some fan letters, which were just so moving where people had written and said, you know, I, I haven't had the courage yet to write to my father, but I'm going to do it now. And you gave me courage. And like, oh my gosh. I mean, <laughs> some of the stories we would hear from people that it, it made people laugh, but it also really touched people yeah. um, at the same time. So yeah, I just, it was, it was amazing to be part of that and to, uh, yeah, to just watch people's reaction. I mean, sometimes we were scared that people were going to fall off the balcony <laughs> because they were so happy <laughs> to be there. Um, and also, of course, you were on the original, you are on the original cast recording. Uh, do you ever listen back to it? Oh, do you know, I can't listen to that recording. <laughs> I, I have to, I do wish so badly that they had recorded a live show which they wouldn't do. We had to, we went to Abbey Road, was it Abbey Road Studios? Maybe it was Angel or something. We went to um, a studio and recorded the album and it's very flat, you know, in terms of the, it doesn't capture the energy, I think, of what we did. Yeah. Um, and also all of our voices have been mixed where we don't sound like ourselves. They've taken all of the warmth out of our voices and tried to make even the men sound like ABBA. So it's a very structured cast album. Um, and I just wish we had been given the chance to do it 
properly, to do it live with all the life that we had in there, it's kind of lost in translation. But, you know, hey ho, I'm on a platinum selling album. Yeah, not I'm many not people can say that, honey. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, I just feel like the cast was so incredible. Um, everyone's voices are so beautiful in the show. And it's kind of, yeah, it got kind of lost in production, I would say. But it's, you know, it's a moment in history. And you can never, you know, you can never recreate that. It's, it's done now. Would you, would you be interested in going back to the show if you, like, oh, now yeah. you could play Donna? I, do you know, it's so funny because I'm in a WhatsApp group with my fellow original cast members. We call ourselves the originals. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, and I, we were chatting the other day and I was like, how old were you, Paul, when you played my dad? And he was like 42 or 43 or something. And I, I'm 45 now. So <laughs> I am older than my parents were in the show. Crazy. Which is crazy. It's nuts. And I, you know, I, Siobhan, I remember she had her children. When she was playing Donna, her kids were small. Um, and, you know, now I have my own seven, almost 17-year-old boy and my 12-year-old girl. <laughs> And they are older than Siobhan's kids were when we did the shows. It was just, yeah, I would love to go back and, and, and play Donna. That would be such a fun experience. Cross your fingers. But I yeah. don't know if the show will reopen. That's the thing. Yeah. You, so. Do you know what? You are such a great Tanya. I saw you as Tanya. And did you? You were phenomenal. I'm sure I did. Oh, I'm sure I did, did with you as Tanya. Because nobody has the legs like you I mean come on and um, you're the you're like the funniest person alive so um <laughs> thank you yeah you I mean you're you're born to play that role um <laughs> well thank you anyway let's go back to you back to you <laughs> um so I was gonna say how does one sort of top this is your entrance into the arena and it's like this massively the show becomes the smash hit uh you were in it for a year yeah, so yeah. I was offered to stay, um, but I felt that I had, you know, I was, a, I, was a, I was at that point 24 years old. It was my first ever role, and I felt like it would be the safe option to stay, and that would have been great, you know, I would have had an increased paycheck and a safe job, um, but I felt that it was important that I take risks early in my career and do different things, um, but I, I kind of, I didn't, I think my, my one kind of thing I could have done better was that I didn't want to be sort of only doing musical theatre. You know, like you, I'm a multifaceted performer. I'm really excited by the different art forms. And mm -hmm. I find that so thrilling to be shifting kind of how you have to, how you have to act, how you have to shift your energy and all of those yeah. things. So I, so I, I try to avoid musical theatre auditions. But once you've done musical theatre, as you know, making the shift into film and TV is a challenge. Um, and also being taken seriously as an actor is a challenge, even though that's what I had studied. So, uh, but I did that and it, you know, panned out very well for me. So was, it was all good. I was gonna say, I mean, you, you sort of ended up doing, um, was Jonathan Creek your first telly job then? In, yeah, in so Jonathan, yeah, so Jonathan Creek was my first TV job uh, in the UK. Pro was it ever? Maybe it was my first ever TV job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I watched it the other day and there is a very funny scene. Um, there you are up in the Highlands in Scotland playing an American actress. It was great, sort of American ingenue actress. And there's this very funny scene where you sort of seduce Julia Sawala. <laughs> And I was like, what, what struck me so much. was really funny was that, like, how tame everything is. It's sort of like this weird, awkward rubbing of her ankle. I was like, what is that? Um, but as you were great. I don't know, it's like PG, BBC. I don't know. It was yeah. the weirdest thing. They were like, <laughs> play with her ankle bracelet, you know. <laughs> it's like they couldn't have anything too much. Yes. So that's what we got. I mean... <laughs> Well, there you go. Now we, we know. We're laughing a lot. <laughs> but you have actually, <laughs> you have done uh, 
incredibly, you've done, you've managed to sustain a successful career in not just one country, two countries for 20 years or more. Uh, how have you navigated that sort of working uh, between the two? Do you find it difficult or is it easy to just slot back into work in Norway when you're there? I realize that's about no, five. I find, I find it quite, I find it quite easy. And in fact, I feel really glad. I mean, I'm so grateful that I have two countries to stand on in a way because um as you know being a, an actor in the uk the competition is so tough here and it's really it can be really really difficult to keep your craft alive to keep um you know your skill sets sharp and all of that um and because i've had norway i think i've had the opportunity to play roles i would never have been cast in here because norway doesn't typecast in quite the same way and so they're a lot more, I would say, open-minded uh, to how they're casting. Um, at least in my case, that's my experience with it. Uh, and also, they pay very well over there uh, compared to over here. So that's nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've, I've had a lot of fun navigating the two. I've, it's been good for my uh, Norwegian to be able to do that, obviously. So my Norwegian mm -hmm. is still... 100% clean so I you know I don't sound like an English person speaking Norwegian <laughs> yeah. so I've kept both of those um probably very good for my brain as well I'm sure and what a wonderful thing to have an asset in life but also particularly as an actor to be bilingual um yeah. you know to have another language that you speak fluently it can only but well, open look at you. um look at you as well. well you've straddled two countries too Yes, well, three actually, because I lived in the States as well. So for of a long course. time, yeah. <laughs> so, but Me language too. wise, sadly, yes, exactly. Um, language wise, no one speaks, not really, Afrikaans is not really that uh, needed <laughs> um, here. <laughs> thankfully, thankfully now, probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I wanted to chat a little bit about your amazing musical theatre credits, because I know that you've done television and we'll get to that as well. But I mean, you really have done some incredible roles. Sophie, obviously, in Mamma Mia, which we've talked about. Sarah Brown in Guys and Dolls, one of my favourite shows. And I realised as I was putting this interview together that I saw you before I knew you in it. You were amazing. Because I suddenly was like, hang on, I, I went to see her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you've played Florence in Chess twice, uh, Grace Farrell in Annie, and of course, Eva Peron in Evita. What, and that's just a few of them. Those are like the highlighted, uh, <laughs> the edited highlights. What do you look for in a musical role and in a musical? Like what attracts you to the job? It really is. Um... I'm going to tell you, hello. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, Oh my gosh, what attracts me to it? Well, first of all, uh, I, I, I love to have fun in my work. So if I know that the people who I'll be working with are brilliant people and we're going to have fun with that show, I almost, I would say, look less maybe on the role than that, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I've done a lot of varied things. But I do look for the fact that I can stretch and challenge myself. Um, and I've gotten to do that in all of those roles. They're all quite different, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and that's been so much fun for me. And so if I find that something uh, isn't exciting in terms of what I can do with it, then it's not so interesting for me. I can mm -hmm. just rather not bother them. Uh, because I've always felt like I'm, I never want to take a job because I feel desperate. That's just not going to bring the right energy so I always want to do a job when I'm excited about the character when I feel like this is something either that I'm stretching myself or that I feel like I am that person like I can embody them so well um and I guess that was the thing with with Sarah Brown was that it was it, it was just the most beautiful role I think I've ever played yeah uh, and I think it's such an interesting role because for those of you who are not familiar with Guys and Dolls, Sarah Brown is a Salvation Army um, girl who is 
trying to save all of the gamblers from themselves, so say, save them from damnation. But then she falls in love with the main gambler, not realizing that she is one of his uh, gambles. Uh, <laughs> she's one of his kind of um, bets. Bets. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and it's just a, a wonderful part to play. So that was, yeah, I just, I could have played Sarah Brown forever. I think it was the you. It's quite challenging because you have to be multifaceted doing that role. Yeah. Even though it looks on paper like the easiest one, but I think it's the hardest one. Well, no, because she's got to be quite prim. You have to be funny. She's terribly mm -hmm. prim and proper and correct in the first half, and then of course she has this amazing kind of Havana. Yeah, they go to Havana and all sorts of things happen where they fall in love. Um, and I think it's it's one of those things you have to be careful if she's played too coy and sweet, it's sickly sweet. Um, but she also can't be too overtly sexy. So it's a fine balance and a, quite a big thing. Um, I wanted to chat a bit about Eva Perón though, because that, mm. I mean, that's a huge thing, you know, and got yeah. really low, low, low bits and then big, massive belty bits. Firstly, how did you kind of pace yourself um, vocally with that? D like singing eight shows a week in an outside amphitheatre must be quite hard. Yeah, well, I, I mean, to be honest, luckily, we were, we, because it was a limited season, it was only 10 shows. Okay. So that was it. So in a way, I knew that no matter what happened, it's only 10 shows. Yeah. Um, but you know, had I had I had to do that eight shows a week, obviously it would have been very different and I would have had to be a lot more careful. Um, but as it was, I could kind of play with it and not have to worry too much about that. But it was, um, I think Andrew Lloyd Webber must absolutely hate Evita because <laughs> that, that role is so, it is, it is so hard to sing because like you say, it has really low parts and it has really high parts. But not only that, it changes so in style. So you have classical parts and then you have parts where you're almost screaming. Um, yeah. You know, you're really shouty. Um, and, and also, you know, she's not written terribly sympathetically. <laughs> so um, it, it, that, that was a really, uh, probably the most challenging role I've ever had to play. And probably the furthest away from I would say me as a person. Um, yeah. And so it was such a thrill. And I, uh, I loved our director, uh, Justin. He, um, I felt like he made the piece as balanced as you can with that role, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Because I think sometimes she's made so harsh that you, you don't feel anything when she dies. Yeah. Um, and, and, doing my research for the role that's my favorite part of a show is the sits probe and the research i love those parts um and doing the research i really felt like it was such a conflicted uh opinion about her everyone else had an opinion and i mean we see that today with with polarizing public figures mm. right where you either hate them or you love them like there's no in between they're either the messiah or they're a demon um and at particularly with female candidates. And so the vitriol she was experiencing, I was kind of drawing upon what I could see happening. You know, at that time it was kind of, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton had just lost. Mm -hmm. So I drew a lot from that and imagined what if she had, you know, won. Um, and uh, yeah, Evita, you know, she did so many good things that are not talked about in that show. So I carried that with me because I felt like the show was written very much from a male perspective. So I did try to pull in what I could of her humanity, even though it's not written like that in the piece. Um, and that felt better to me because I kind of feel like the musical doesn't feel quite fair of her as a human being. But I think that's what also was in my case what makes it interesting is the fact that you had all that kind of backstory and knowledge because as you said you're not given the opportunity to say it or to sing it but an audience I think they might not know exactly what it is but there's an essence of that and also by the time you know when you sing Buenos Aires she's in a very different part in her life as to where she is when you sing Don't Cry For Me Argentina um, 
I had never seen the show. Uh, I obviously knew the music. I'd auditioned for it in LA, but <laughs> um, had never actually seen it. And uh, went to see it in Regent's Park um, last year. And I was really, it, it's an incredible show. I agree with you. It's yeah. very much from a male perspective. And I just sat there going, how does this, how do you sing this? It's like vocal gymnastics, really yeah. tough. Um, but what a wonderful sort of, badge of honor to have uh you know yeah. in your cv um but it, it, it's like a jean valjean for a man uh, yeah I, I think it's that kind of role and it felt so i i can't think actually of a more iconic female leading role to play it's like the penultimate penultimate penultimate, yes, penultimate. Uh, penultimate. <laughs> well the ultimate not penultimate the ultimate the ultimate there you go uh <laughs> <laughs> like the ultimate lead role I think for for a woman and and I wouldn't have been ready before either I was only ready because I had had a few years on my bum uh and so you know I felt prepared to to take it on and yeah I I loved it and there was an amazing cast and a beautiful place uh to do it as well so yeah that was definitely one of my favorites as well yeah there's some wonderful footage actually online if you sort of go through all the theaters and that there's some beautiful footage of you singing and the set looked amazing um i am aware that we are as usual running out of time but what i was going to suggest uh because instagram cuts you off after an hour um Gosh. what i was going to suggest is maybe that we could uh come back if you are don't don't have to be anywhere yeah, yeah, I'm conversation and then come back and finish the, Let's the questions. Let's do it. I've dedicated myself to this and I talk a lot, as you know, so just carry on. <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll do that. We'll wrap up in the, in the second half. Uh, I see somebody has sent a question, so we might try and answer that in case they can't come back for a second hour. Um, okay. Do you have a, a favourite musical role? You were saying you, you're Sarah Brown, you could have played that for the rest of your life. Um, still, is that still your, like... I think so. I, I just... that. That show, that role, I can't, I, I can't pinpoint what it is about that role, but I think she was probably the most sort of comical role that I've played. I, I got to be, I felt like I got to be super funny. Yeah. Uh, because she's not, she's not funny in herself. It's her release of all of those, uh, you know, um, chains that she's been carrying around when she releases that and she gets drunk in Havana it is so funny yeah. I had such a laugh and the, my scenes that I got to do with the guys who played um god my brain uh who played <laughs> Nathan Detroit um you know I just had so much fun with those scenes uh, and um yeah, it's just a lovely role you get to like fall in love every night it's great yeah <laughs> And sing a few it's banging fun. tunes, and that's always good too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's, you know, drama and funny and cute. Yeah, I loved yeah. it, loved it. And then, I think it was in 2007, you found yourself on stage with none other than Annie Lennox, Peter Gabriel, Brian May, Sharon Kaur, Angelique Kidjo, <laughs> all in honor of Nelson Mandela's AIDS charity. How did you get become involved in, in that concert? Well, that was really, like with most things, it seems, in my career, that just came about in such a funny way. So I had heard about this concert happening like a year prior or something, and I contacted the the uh, the concert people in my hometown. So this was happening in my hometown. Nelson Mandela was coming, who I, you know, used to see sing you, that three Nelson Mandela song so yeah. he would get out of prison as a child and so he was coming with all of these amazing people uh to my hometown and I was like I have to be a part of it I don't care how but I've got to be there so I contacted them had nothing and I did it again had nothing and then um literally I think what was it like a week before the concert, I mean, by now I knew that I wasn't going to go because I hadn't heard anything. But yeah. the week of the concert, I get a phone call saying, um, hey, uh, we need someone to present with the South African presenter who is called DJ Sugar. Yeah. Uh, Rochelle, she's so gorgeous. She's amazing. Um, I know her. She's amazing. She's my friend. 
And, um, <laughs> and they said, we need someone to present with Rochelle. Uh, would you consider, you know, coming here and doing that? And then maybe sing a song. And I was like, oh my God, it is happening. So that's how that happened. So I flew to my hometown of Tromsø. Uh, and all of a sudden, I've never presented in all my life. This is my first presenting job was to present live on national television in front of 20,000 people. Uh, and, you know, with cue cards and stuff. I'd never done this before. Yeah. How terrible. <laughs> with all these celebrities, with all of these, uh, like, legends of music. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and then I would get to sing Dancing Queen as well. What they didn't tell me at the time was that I would get to stand there and sing with Annie Lennox. They were calling my name to come on stage. Annie Lennox is going, Lisa, where are you? I mean, Amazing. come on. It was insane. Yeah, yeah. Was absolutely crazy. What? Brian May playing his guitar. Uh, I mean, I was talking to Brian May about kittens and stuff. It was <laughs> so, like, blew my mind. <laughs> what an amazing thing to have been a part of and all for such a great charity and for such an extraordinary man. Yes. And I learned so many things, you know, um, being a part of that, there were so many things I didn't know about HIV AIDS. You know, mm -hmm. I thought I was really clued up, but I didn't know, for example, that you can get it through breast milk and all of these things, or that Russia was one of the most um, infected countries. I didn't know that. And, yeah. uh, and the biggest thing, of course, was that I actually got to meet Nelson Mandela himself Amazing. and that was probably one of the most extraordinary moments of my life that was yeah that I, I can't even describe it. it he was so special he was quite something wasn't he everyone honestly I was in the press room and all the photographers looked like they were gonna cry he was sitting in a chair by this point he was almost completely blind yeah um, he couldn't walk very well and so I was told that when I went in to have my picture taken with him, that obviously he couldn't see me uh, very well. And so I came to stand next to him and I, I touched him by the shoulders and, and I said, it's a great honor to meet you, Mr. Mandela. And he said, yes, it's a great honor for a young lady like you to meet me. <laughs> and first I was like, is he joking? Is he serious? And then he laughed, and I was like, okay. <laughs> he was, That's he was so funny. Yeah. Um, but what um, I mean, I would have taken it seriously anyway, because yes, it's true. It is a great honor for me to meet you, and I meant it sincerely. <laughs> um, but he was joking. But yeah, what, a, what an extraordinary man, and, and how many lessons we learned from him and from yeah. his dignity and grace and courage. Uh, and coming through adversity. I mean, we can't, I, I don't think we can ever even begin to imagine um, how he, he had that journey as a human being. Yeah, no, it's he's beautiful. amazing. I, um, I was very lucky enough to meet him too uh, on one of my trips back to South Africa. And, you know, it was just exactly that, you know, um, he was just wonderful and thank God for him, really, because he single-handedly changed the face of my country, you know, yeah. um, and really did amazing work. Uh, it's like meeting a deity. That's the only way I can describe it, is that it feels like you're meeting someone holy or something. Yeah. It is so powerful that the, the um, effect he had on the room um, and, and what he did for, for your country, Suan, is just, yeah, thank God for him. Yeah, absolutely. What else can we say? <laughs> so we're gonna go from Nelson Mandela and deities to the campery and glitter and wonder that is the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> <laughs> because you had uh, an involvement in the Eurovision, Eurovision, Eurovision Song Contest. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that and what that must have been like, that extraordinary opportunity. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it was, it, that was, that was a really, uh, like, I can't even, it can't even compare to anything else. The Eurovision Song Contest is like its own living, breathing thing. Yeah. And it is, and I mean, I watched this since I was a child and it was one of the things I got into first was the Eurovision Song Contest in terms of my own fandom as a child. 
And of course, we all remember Bobby Socks, you know, who won from Norway. And so we have great history with that. Um, and I was invited to, uh, to kind of be one of the people to kind of audition with the song. And uh, initially, I was actually sent a fantastic song by Thomas Gerson, uh, who's one of the big, big Eurovision writers. But I felt it was so close to an ABBA song that it almost felt like I can't do it. Like, it, <laughs> it's almost like it doesn't feel right. Like, it was too similar. It was like a Winner Takes It All song. It was an amazing yeah. song. But, um, but anyway, and then I found these amazing writers who sent me another song called With Love. And of course, what was special about it was that this wasn't long after the horrific terror attack in Norway, where Anish uh, Breivik murdered lots of uh, mm. children, teenagers. Um, and this song, you know, it, it, it's quite sweet, but it had, a, it had a pure intention, which was that we have to move forward with love. Um, and yeah, that, that was kind of what I carried with me with this song. And then I got to do the actual uh, sort of, um, it was before the semifinals, and you're at this military base. So you're driven around this military what? base by all the military guys. I got to fly an F-16 simulator. It was so cool. Um, landed the plane, the simulator. That was Ooh. a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Dead price. And uh, yeah, it was just such a strange experience. And you're out there in an airport hangar, like a F-16 hangar. Nice. That's where the show was. And it's such a beast of a show. There is, you know, it, it's one of the biggest kind of concerts I've ever done. It was even bigger than the Nelson Mandela concert in terms yeah. of how crazy it was. If you can imagine that. I mean, it was, yeah. It was, and I had pyrotechnics. I had a gold dress. I had choreography. It was a lot of fun. Um, Do you yeah, get nervous? Pardon? Sorry. As I said, do you get nervous in situations like that? Because that's such a huge, huge thing to be a part of. I would be terrified. I know it is. Quite, it is quite scary because it's not. It's not the. It's not the singing that's hard. It's that you're thinking about so many different things: the camera, the sound, the the pyrotechnics that are going to go off, the audience. I, I had never used in-ear before in my life, which means that you're getting your sound inside your ears through these earplugs, like AirPods basically, but just you can't hear anything else. And so you're feeling like you're in a bubble. You can't even hear mm. the audience. It's such a crazy experience. It's like you're singing to yourself um, and you're having to navigate all of these different things. And you're in a completely open stage almost, like people are everywhere around the stage and on like hanging on the stage it is nuts um but super fun and i just you know gave it my all um and unfortunately it wasn't enough for the semi-final but that's okay you know two of my my very good friends got to the semi-final so and it's all good it's because there were great things ahead and great things to come I'm going to stop us here because we're getting the countdown and we will be back for part two. Uh, bear with me, everyone, for a few minutes because I have to save the video to IGTV and that takes a few minutes. But I will be back shortly and we will resume and get to Frozen, which I'm yeah. very excited to talk about. All right, see you guys in a minute. <laughs> see ya. Hello, hello, and we're back for part two. Part two of Half or Hosts Lisa Stocker. If you're only joining us now, welcome. This is my 20th show. I can't believe that. My lights seem to be dying a little bit, but there we go. Um, so, yes, my 20th show. I can't believe that. Uh, if you are just joining us now, um, I'm chatting to the incredible Lisa Stocker, who is the voice of Elsa in Frozen in the Norwegian dub uh, and has had the most extraordinary career. She's done so many wonderful things. And we are going to carry on right now, too, um, because we were just getting to all the juicy stuff when, of course, time ran out. So more fun. Uh, here we go. Connecting with Lisa. Um, it is really strange once these interviews finish on IGTV and they go to the YouTube channel that you can't see the comments. Hello. Sorry, I was mid-sentence. <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> 
Um, I'm going to have a swig of water because I always like to have my, my water with me. Good girl. Cheers. Cheers. Is yours gin, though? No. I wish. I wish. <laughs> I wish too, mine. <laughs> so I already talk a lot without gin, so I think if you had the gin, it'd be a little <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Um, yes, yeah, so you have had, as we've already established now, this wonderful career on stage in two different countries, but you have been equally on, as busy on screen as you have on stage, uh, both in Norway and most recently here on the BBC, which we'll get to shortly. Um, I wanted to chat to you, though, about long, flat balls, <laughs> which... I was going to try and right? say with a straight face, but I was like, what is the film about, Lisa? A long, flat ball. <laughs> Do you know, <laughs> it is actually a hilarious Norwegian film. And if you get to see it, like I'm in the number, the, the second film. So right. it's like, it's a, but it's a local, it's set in the director's hometown of Fredrikstad. Uh, Harald Svart is the director. He's a famous Norwegian director. He directed Karate Kid. Like, he's amazing. And um, and it's set in his hometown. And it's about these the four or five Norwegian guys. Uh, they, like, work in a car workshop and stuff like that. And it's about football. So it's a proper body movie. Um, and much hilarity ensues. Um, right. They get themselves into all sorts of situations. So in the second film that I'm a part of, where I play a naval officer, and I had like Demi Moore's uniform. I'm not oh, amazing! I was like, did I keep it? Can I keep it? I loved it. <laughs> I could wear that every day. I felt very, very, um, yeah, I liked it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I liked myself in uniform. Um, but I got to play this naval officer um, basically, the guys, these football guys, they uh, trigger um, like a nuclear missile or something from a submarine. And then they have to save the day. So it's a hero movie. So nice. that was yeah, a hoot. And of course, which I'm sure you'll, you'll get to, is uh, our friend Don Johnson. <laughs> yes. So I was going to say, now you worked with Don, did, you did do Guys and Dolls together. Right. And is that how he ended up in long flat balls? I still can't say sort of. the so, <laughs> Sort of. So I was already a friend of Harold Svart, the director. There's my mom watching. Hi, mom. Hi, mom. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because um, I had shot a commercial before with the director. Um, and he had been in a documentary of mine in LA and things. And so he got in touch with me and he said, I'm trying to get a hold of Don Johnson, but his, you know, I can't get through his people. Um, could you just give him my script and just let him know I'm trying to get in touch with him? So I did that because Don and I were working together. And right. uh, yeah, that's how we ended up in the same film. We just had a hoot. So we came off the musical and then we went straight into filming Long Flat Balls, <laughs> where I have <laughs> a really potty mouth in Norwegian. It's quite funny. Oh, fantastic. Or oh, give us some Norwegian swearing, if you can. Oh, give my us God. Some... Uh, <laughs> okay, this is, this is how the uh, thing goes. Drama no in a fetske fetsa, that helvete has cooked over sheet till you fall the hebrew of it. That's very rude, by the way. I love it. I absolutely love it. You're going to have to teach me that. <laughs> Just don't say it to anyone. It's so crude. It's really embarrassing. No, well, I'll ask you later what it means. <laughs> and the Can't other role I want to Yeah, no, definitely not on TV. I got the gist, I think. <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask you about, I, I don't know how you pronounce this, uh, but the English translation would be suburbia or small town life. How would you say that, the series that you were in? More belief. More belief. More belief, yeah. <laughs> More believe. And uh, who did you play in that? Uh, I played, I think it's Merete. This is a long time ago. I think her name was Merete. So she was the wife of the, the main character. Um, and Robert Stoltenberg is a really incredible comedian in Norway um, and impersonator. And he creates all of these different characters. So he was playing a pastor and I was playing his pastor's wife. 
Um, and right. it was a lovely role, like really, again, another kind of take on life that I hadn't done before. Um, and it was a lot of fun to shoot because although the show is a comedy, my particular scenes were kind of serious, a bit like The Office, you know, where you're playing it seriously, yeah. but the, the funny comes out of the situation. So yeah, that was just, it was brilliant. And it was such a um, amazing experience getting to work with him and, and watching how he creates all of these characters and, um, yeah, and, and working with the, the um, Norwegian BBC, effectively, NRK. They're like the Norwegian version of the BBC. And yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah, because I, um, I did watch a little bit of it um, online. Of course, I didn't understand what I was watching. But I was fascinated because he plays about five different roles, doesn't he? Four or five mm -hmm. different people, including women. And he was great. Yeah. I mean, I think he yeah. was great. <laughs> He, he he is really extraordinary and you like if you met he's so handsome if you yeah. met him in real life he's a beautiful looking man i'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying that but he's such a, a good looking guy and he just completely changes himself to to yeah to play people from all walks of life and he has such humility and and love for these characters so it's not done out of you know, it's the best kind of comedy where mm. it comes from a place of love. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really sweet. He also plays a really horrible character, uh, which you just don't want anything good to happen to that man. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun to watch him work. I learned a lot from that, from that particular job. It was probably the longest TV, because it was a series. It was the longest yeah. kind of TV role I had played like that so yeah i i had a lot of fun with it and it's obviously stood you in good stead because last year you debuted uh on a british institution uh in a time where the doctor is a woman you were in doctor oh, who ah, wow. <laughs> Tell me about, because uh, I remember sort of, you and I obviously speak um, <laughs> outside of this interview and you were like, I can't talk about it. And I was like, I mean, to keep the secret is so hard. But... The worst thing. <laughs> so tell me how that audition came your way, obviously from the wonderful Andy Pryor. Um, tell us about Doctor Who. <laughs> yes, so, the, so they were obviously looking for a, for a Norwegian who could speak English for this role. And it was the way, like this happens to me a lot where something comes in and I just know in my bones that I'm going to get it. Um, Sounds to me too. Before I even, do you have this as well? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just know it. It's like the script comes in and I'm like, this is happening. Like, I know this is happening. And... Um, and I had that feeling when that came through. And yeah. I mean, first of all, as you know, as Stargate, you know, with you, where you're a goddess, I mean, hello, you're just so amazing. They need to bring you back, baby, darling, by the way. Um, yeah, well, from your to... lips to God's ears, honey, I'd love that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd, I'd pay to watch that. Um, Thank you. But, you know, it's an institution. And then to get to audition for Andy Pryor, who's such a legend in the casting yeah. world. Um, and the fact that the doctor for the first time ever, why did it take so long? But for the first time ever is played by a woman um, yeah. and by the wonderful Jodie Whittaker. So the whole thing just felt like all good things. And uh, the funny thing is with, the, so I, I basically, I play a dead woman who doesn't know she's dead but it turns out that she isn't dead. She is the universe. She's the solid tract. And yes. I then transform into a frog. So <laughs> it was an interesting role to prepare for. Quite a, I was gonna say, how does one prepare for that? I mean, did when, when they gave you the sides, because I imagine they're massively secretive about the scripts and stuff. So were you, did you have any idea what the script was about? Or did they just go, here's some dialogue, have a go? I can't remember. I think they, I think they did explain it to me, what this scene was, what the whole thing was about. So I yeah. think they gave that to me. 
Um, and I mean, they're very generous, first of all, because they do give you time to learn things properly so that when you can go in, you can be properly prepared, which I love because it just means yeah. I'm a lot better when I can do that. Um, and yeah, I just, I kind of had to go from the standpoint that she doesn't know that she is something else. I just mm. had to play it truthfully uh, because otherwise it's almost, it's almost, you know, it's so bizarre to be in three minds at once. It doesn't quite work. So I kind of played it so that my realization happens towards the end. And I think you can see it actually in the clip. You can actually see the wheels turn in my head. Yeah. Where, where the universe kind of wakes up inside this woman. <laughs> it's so bizarre. But I loved it. It was, yeah, it was incredible, incredible um, job that. And where did you guys film it? Did you film it here or was that filmed abroad? We filmed it in Cardiff. And the very special thing happened that we did the first ever table read of the new Doctor Who, even though I was later, I was in that because they did the table read for the first and the seventh episode. So our episode got switched from seventh to ninth in the actual shoot. But for the table read, where everyone was there. All the creators were there. Amazing. Like every single person. Yeah, I can't even, it was, it was again, one of those, it was like the Benny situation, the Nelson Mandela situation. You're in a room where you are part of history and it's a very strange feeling. And it just, it's like the whole room is electric. And we were all so humbled and grateful to be there. And also it was very special because my lovely friend, um, Ellie Woolwork, who plays the blind girl in the show, she is the first ever real blind actress to play a blind person at the BBC, which is yeah. nuts. Nuts. Um, nuts. Why on earth is it taking this long? Right. So that was really special too, because Ellie is just an extraordinary actress and to watch her in action uh, was, was also so moving. She played my daughter. And yes. so we're good friends. She was, she's local to me. Oh, okay. That's so nice. You didn't know her before though, right? No, no, we'd never no. met. I was like, oh, you live across Amazing. the river from me. So we met up last Christmas, which was really <laughs> And what was it like being sort of led by Jodie Whittaker, having this very strong, wonderfully talented actress at the helm? I'm absolutely in awe of her. Um, and all of them, I mean, they're just all unbelievable actors, that entire team. Um, but she, I mean, it's hard to even explain how talented she is. She has so much text. Uh, mm -hmm. I have no idea like how her mind absorbs all of that. She is, you know, she's, um, she's very technical and she's, um, she always finds the nuances in there so beautifully. Um, and to watch her just do it, and she checks with the, with, the, with the script person, you know, that she's got it right, and she goes over and over and over. And then when it's, when, and then she has fun in between the takes, but then when it's shooting time, she's just on it. I mean, yeah, yeah they're, they're an incredible bunch of actors, all of them. And we, they, they, they really uh, took us in as though we were part of the family. And I, that to me was really um, moving because, you can actually, when you're doing a show, like they were, they were obviously in their first season. So maybe that's part of it. But yeah, I think if you do a show for like five years or whatever, you kind of become a bit blase about all these people coming in and out because you know, you're not going to see them again. Mm -hmm. But for us, we were just welcomed with open arms and, you know, like we were part of them. And, and I thought that was so lovely. Yeah. I think that's always a, a sign of a good number one, you know, of a good leader on the team and the first person on the call sheet, that yeah. if they are a great leader, it, it makes such a difference. Yeah. Um, how, just, how, she's just extraordinary. Yeah. And long yeah. may it continue. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, how long did you have to keep it a secret? Like <laughs> six, no, for, no, first I did, no, I did, it's like a year. No. Yeah, it was like a year. Oh my God, I don't know if I could do it. I'd be like, I'd have to go, I'd have to move. 
It was awful. Hi, Adam. Oh, friend. hi, Adam. Uh, it was awful. I had to keep it a secret for a year. And I mean, I can keep secrets which are, you know, serious secrets. But like, good news, that is hard. Yeah. Good news is hard to keep a secret. And yeah. But I did. I was dead proud of myself. I was yeah. very, very proud of myself. You See, did. As you know, if you tell, you get fired. Yeah. No, and it's not worth doing that, but it is, it must have been very difficult. But as you said, you are good at keeping secrets because you had another enormous secret that you had to keep, which was that you were going to be singing at this year's Academy Awards, which you did in February. You got on stage and joined, uh, I don't know how many you were in total, I think eight or nine of you in total? Yeah, we were nine in total, but you know, I was, yeah, one of the nine. Yeah, so nine uh, Elsas from around the world um, singing at the Academy Awards. So let's talk about Frozen <laughs> because it has broken every box office record. I think it's the biggest Disney animated hit they've ever produced. Um, how, uh, and I know, because I know you, that you are a lifelong Disney uber fan. You've loved Disney, you love his ethos, the work, the animation. How did Elsa come into your life? Oh, again, it is super funny how these things happen. So I was playing Grace Farrell in the musical Annie at the time in Norway at the biggest theater there, Folketafra. And um, as you say, I've been a Disney fan my entire life. One of my first memories was Disneyland uh, as a little girl and yeah. refusing to let go of Mickey Mouse. <laughs> um, and I was in the show and I got a phone call from the director of a new Disney movie. And she was like, uh, Elsa, she's called Elsa. <laughs> and <laughs> Elsa called me. <laughs> I know. Uh, she called me and she was like, hey, listen, we're doing... Um, the newest Disney movie, the new Frozen movie, which, you know, we knew Frozen was coming, but we didn't know anything about it because the only thing that released was that scene with Sven and Olaf with, you know, no dialogue and that isn't in the film. Yeah. Uh, so that was all we had seen. We, ha we didn't know anything else. And, uh, and she said they wanted to see me for Anna. And I was so excited. Oh my yeah. goodness. I was so excited. And, uh, and I had never done voiceover before. And voiceover was something I have been intending to get into forever. Um, and uh, and th so the combination of voiceover work with Disney, hello. Yeah. So I mega prepared for this role. Hi, Tulu. You can't come in. You can't come in. Sorry. <laughs> Is that your daughter? No, she can come in. Hi, Tulu. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never get out. Uh, so she's like me. She talks like me. So we'll never finish. Um, but um, so I had done my research. Uh, we've established I love my research. So I'd done my research and figured out that Edina Menzel was going to play Elsa. And I knew that there's no way they're going to hire Edina Menzel unless they're planning a big, big song for her. Because, of course, she's known for Wicked, for playing yeah. Elphaba. And she's known for Rent. And, you know, she's done all of these amazing roles. And she was an Enchanted, a film I missed out on, uh, which uh -huh. was, uh, I actually auditioned for the Amy Adams role. <laughs> did you? I did. And I came to, yeah, they sent my tape to LA in the end. But anyway, oh. I digress. So I had figured out that um, Idina Mazel was going to play Elsa. So I was like, after I did my audition for Anna and it went very well and I was very happy with it. And I'm more suited really to the Kristen Bell role because I have more similarities with Kristen Bell in terms of personality. Yeah. Um, and, and I said, can I please also audition for the role of Elsa because I really feel like, um, like I could do a good job because I know Edina Menzel's voice very well and I can sing like that. And uh, she was like, no, we've already auditioned all of those people that have been sent away. That door is shut, so I'm really sorry. So I, I left it at that. I, I said, but just, just so you know, if anything happens and it comes up, I would love the chance to audition. 
Two weeks went by, I had nothing. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm not even gonna get this on a roll, you know. And um, I get another phone call from Elsa and she says, actually, by the way, we still don't know about Anna, so that is still up for, you know, a review. Yeah. But we have an issue and we actually need to recast Elsa, so could you please come in and sing? So I finally then, because I hadn't heard the song, I didn't know it was Let It Go, I hadn't heard it yet. Right. So they then sent me the song and I can't even, I, I, I cried and probably screamed uh, in uh, alternation because I was so excited. <laughs> Cause I, was like, I mean, that song, I just knew this is it. This is the Oscar song. They're going to nominate that song. Uh, it had, it was so special. The first time I heard it, I was just, you know, you know, we, we do musical theater. We know a good song and we hear a good song. Um, well, yes, except the difference is I would probably be sitting there going, oh my goodness, I have to hit that huge note at the end. I would be terrified. And like, I have seen you, you and I have worked together. Well, actually we haven't worked together. We, we, we attempted to work we together. We did, we've been rehearsing together. Yes. And we would meet at your house and you would just be sitting like on your sofa, literally like, you know, casual, and whack out a show tune of epic proportions. And on my birthday, um, my big birthday, uh, a few years ago, you sang and you blew us all away. And you were like, oh, I've had a few drinks. I haven't really warmed up. And I was just like, listen to her. I've got Elsa <laughs> singing, let it go at my birthday party. Amazing. That was a good party. That was a good party. <laughs> So you go in and you sing, let it go. And what happened then? Well, the director actually cried. Uh, she actually cried. She was so happy uh, because she hadn't had anyone hit the note before. Uh, so she was really, really, um, yeah, she, she, was, she was saying, you know, that, that she couldn't guarantee, obviously, that I would get the role because it wasn't up to her. She yeah. had to send it away to LA and then it was up to all the big bosses. Um, and they would decide who got the who got cast. Disney are very very strict about their international voices. So if anyone thinks that they just pluck someone off the street and like put them in a Disney movie, it's a very uh, strict process. And they mm. send in a lot of suggestions um, to make sure they nail it. Um, and so yeah, so so they sent it off, and uh, and then I had to wait again, and I still didn't know about Anna. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I and then I finally got the answer and yeah again when I, I I was told on the phone and I was just screaming I was so beside myself I just knew this was going to be a life-changing moment also because the story was set in my home home country of Norway yes. and so it was inspired by Norwegian culture and I just and I, I used to read the Snow Queen as a child they used to terrify me the real story is very scary um, and very different to Frozen. But yeah, so it, it just, it was like all of these different pieces just fitted together. And uh, it, it, even though, you know, I'm obviously a dub, so I'm not the original voice, which is done brilliantly by Edina Menzel, but it still felt quite special to be the Norwegian voice. Well, hugely special. And also, I mean, you're all over the internet, Lad and Gar. I was singing it all weekend. <laughs> Even my husband was walking around the house going, let it go, let it go. I was like, oh my God, we've, I've unleashed a monster. <laughs> we're talking that song out of your head. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about the two beautiful drawings behind you because I know that um, they were given to you or done for you specifically by one of the chief Elsa animators at Disney. Yeah. How, so how did that I happen? So I, um, after Frozen happened, um, I had a kind of open invitation to come to visit the Disney Animation Studio. And I thought, how, how can I make that happen and make it as important an occasion as possible? Um, so I got in touch with uh, uh, I, I, I contacted my agent to help me do this. So together yeah. we found a TV network willing to do a mini 
documentary, if you will, about Frozen for Norwegian TV. So I flew over to do that. And so you can watch it on my YouTube channel, channel actually, Lisa Stocker. You can see this episode, uh, Lisa, uh, what is it? Lisa Visits Disney, or I can't remember what it's called, but it's there and it's subtitled yeah. in English. Uh, but I got to meet Disney, the animation studios, and part of the documentary tour, I got to meet Mark Henn. So I'll show mm -hmm. you this one. So Mark Henn was the lead animator on The Lion King. He animated Simba. So he's the oh, Simba, wow. um, he's the main animator for Simba, and he's also the main animator for Princess Jasmine. And he told me that he based Princess Jasmine's facial expressions on his sister. So that's pretty amazing. Yes. So, so Mark Henn, I don't know if you, my ring light is kind of in the way. Hang yes. on. Well, gives, you her a lovely halo. gives her a lovely halo there. Yeah. But Mark, when he was drawing this, he wasn't looking at his paper. He wow. was looking at me, talking to me while drawing. So like, this is like practically him not looking at what he's doing. Look at that beautiful face. How extraordinary. Look at her hair. Yeah. Um, so he just did that, just sitting there chatting away like it was nothing. And I was just like, how are you doing this? <laughs> um, so that was this one by Mark Henn. And he's, a, he's actually a Disney, a Disney legend. He's one of their legend animators. He was there um, working with all of the great. Uh, let me put it there. And then uh, this amazing animator called Yin Kim, who's another newer legend at Disney. Um, he does all of the character animations for Elsa. So he draws like a, I don't know what they call it, but it's like a mood uh, board of all of Elsa's facial expressions in all of her different feelings. Oh, wow. So, so yeah, he draws all of her feelings for the animator. So they all have the same template of feeling to then animate. So Yin Kim gave me this. Oh, I love that. This is oh, the handsome awesome. Elsa. Uh, and I didn't get to meet Yin Kim, but, um, but he had asked someone, he'd heard I was in the building. <laughs> so he came and gave, so they gave this to me. And then this year, um, when I was there, we were given, I thought, I can't show you art all day. <laughs> but they gave us <laughs> these extraordinary watercolor um, numbered prints. Uh, from Disney with all with the new film. I think I've got four beautiful wow. art pieces. They were all, everything's going on my wall. So I put all of this stuff on my wall. Um, and I have one that all of my Elsa's signed it. So we all signed it. And oh, we oh, also oh. had, I have to show you this just yes. very quickly. I know we have, uh, you probably have things to do, but this, oh, you can't see with I my ring. What, what does it say? It I, I can't, what does it say? So this is Into the Unknown. <gasps> this is the sheet music for Into the Unknown uh, that we use for the Oscars. And this is Bobby Lopez signed my sheet music who composed it with Kristen Lopez, Kristen Anderson Lopez. Um, and this was our Oscar music that he signed for me. That's so um, cool. So very, that's quite very cool. by my piano. <laughs> I love it. So let's talk about the Oscars. What went through your mind when you got that call? Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I actually knew about the Oscars probably before most other people because, um, first of all, I thought it was a given that Frozen would win everything. I mean, I'm sorry, it's such a gorgeous movie. So I thought they would just sweep the board because I've never seen animation like it. But before Christmas, one of my very best friends, Lynette Howell Taylor, is the producer of the Oscars with Stephanie Allen. Right. Or Elaine. I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name. But so my friend Lynette was the producer and she rang me before Christmas and she said, listen, I'm producing the Oscars. I have a dream about um, having all of the Elsas on stage. You know, let's make this happen. Yeah. And... Um, and she just wanted to give me a heads up. So, so, so I was then formally told a lot later, like January time, we were formally told that this may happen. Um, and then first of all, we had to wait for multiple things. 
first we had to wait for the song to be nominated. Yeah. So if it wasn't nominated, we wouldn't go. And I was actually at the airport in Oslo on my way home to London, watching the announcement live at the airport. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. <laughs> like the My Fair Lady scene with uh, Dover. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Come on, Dover, maybe let me know. Um, so I was sitting there watching it live and when they announced it, I was like, oh, thank God. Thank God it's, a, it's at least happening. Yeah. But then we had to wait for everybody's visas. So of course, if people didn't get their visas, our number wouldn't happen the way that they wanted it to happen. And that took a long time. So I wasn't actually confirmed for the Oscars until I think 10 days before the Oscars. Wow. How much is that? So ahead of that, I then had to, just like a few days before that, I was in Norway and I, uh, and I contacted two of my friends who are amazing designers in Norway. And I asked them, can you please put something together for me for the Oscars? We have like, three days to do it before I fly back to London. Can we do this? That's how it's, it was nuts. Amazing. Well, I uh, hosted at the Oscars on the red carpet, actually outside. We, uh, I was part of the South African and bizarrely Singapore press. That's a long story for a different day. Um, but I remember very specifically, cause it is nuts. The whole experience is like an out of body, bizarre experience. Uh, but it is run with military precision. And as crew or world press, you have very specific parameters that you have to work within and around. Um, and I was curious what the experience was like as a guest. <laughs> well, it's still military precision because we weren't guests, I guess, because we were, we were performers. And so... Yeah, we were, I mean, it was a bit like the scene in Wreck-It Ralph where all the princesses are. So if you've seen that movie, which is the best film in Wreck-It Ralph too, it was a little bit like that where we were all, you know, sitting there. Um, oh, hang on. Let me plug in my phone. Give me one second. Cause I yes, don't want it to die. So my, my sound might be less good, but at least it won't die. Just give me... One second. Sing a song, Suan. Right. Talk amongst yourselves, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't got long to go now. I'm sorry, because I feel I do feel I've kept you going and going and going. So um I can talk and plug myself in at the same there you time. Woohoo! <laughs> Amazing. Let's not kill my Elsa pictures. Uh yes, for heaven's sake, don't ruin those. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> show business, eh? Look, this is like show business, real life right now. Yeah. Uh, this is how it is, very glamorous. Uh, but yeah, we were basically, all of us Elsas, here we go. We were all in a room, backstage, chatting away, doing a lot of waiting. Right. We're plugged in, yes. Can you still hear me? Can you hear yes, me I okay? Can. Yeah, Excellent. Okay. Yeah, so we were all, you know, rehearsing and then we were waiting for hours and hours in this room together right. uh, from all these different countries, speaking different languages. Uh, and some had interpreters and it was just an incredible experience. And they were all, you know, so talented. Just the, the talent of all the people there. And of course, Aurora was there as well from Norway. She sang in the, in the number. And it is military precision. So we had rehearsals, we had music rehearsals. Uh, but one of the biggest moments, I think, for I can speak for all of us who are Elsa's, was the fact that Bobby Lopez came to actually rehearse with us, the composer wow. of Frozen. I mean, yeah, that was something I'll just never forget, is when he came in and rehearsed with us, um, and we were all harmonizing together with Bobby Lopez. It was like, is this even happening? And then to rehearse with Edina Mazel on stage, and she was so gracious to us. Um, and just, you know, we all, every single person there, all we wanted was to do a great job and to make everyone proud of us, you know, and, and pleased that they had invited us and not regretted the decision. Um, so, oh, it was unforgettable. Yeah, I mean, it must have just been, I mean, I remember you and I talking because I kind of guessed, but you couldn't <laughs> tell me and you were like, I can't 
say anything. And I was like, oh my God, you're singing at the Oscars. I know it. Uh, and it was also a very proud moment for, for me as your friend, you know, to watch somebody get up there and represent. Um, and that must have been an amazing feeling, stepping onto a stage in that huge auditorium with a worldwide audience watching. I mean, what, God, I would have been absolutely terrified. Or were you just too excited? <laughs> no, but I think, like, you know, you you are just such a pro. And I think you would have felt probably similar to me was that I very much had it in my mind that it felt like all of the work I had done ahead of this moment was training me for this moment. Yeah. And so I, I thought, you know what? I know what I'm doing. Uh, I can do this. I have done this you know, before in other scenarios. And I literally remember giving myself a pep talk in my head, like a loon, uh, before going on stage where I was like, okay, just enjoy it. Like yeah. really enjoy it. Like be in the moment, love this moment. Just like spread your love to everybody who's watching. And that was what I had in my heart when I sang. And I think you can see it because I'm like, a really overly excited guinea pig. I'm like, <laughs> no, you just look so joyous. Everyone else, everyone else is so graceful and sort of like, you know, they look like real sort of royalty. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it makes me laugh so much seeing that clip. I'm like, she's the overexcited monkey in the corner. No, That's me. But, no, no, not you true. Know, you I did true. love it. I did love it. So. <laughs> and warm and friendly. So, you know, that's what we need as well. <laughs> um, just before we wrap up, I wanted to ask you, one of the things that struck me the minute I met you is you have this wonderful, warm, sunny, really gracious, and you have great largesse uh, of life. You, you're really warm and welcoming. And is that something that you were born with or something that you kind of acquired over the years? Thank you, by the way. That is such a nice thing to say. And by the way, I can say it straight back to you because I remember when we met in an audition room and I remember thinking, I love her. <laughs> I love her. We need to be friends. Yes. Because you are also such a larger than life, uh, you know, such a kind and vivacious and bubbly person. And I'm and super Thank smart you. and so hot. Uh, so yeah, I was just like, I want to be your. I literally was like, I want to be her friend, and I remember we exchanged phone numbers. Yeah, I never do. I don't do that often. Same. Uh, so that's why we became good friends. But I think I, I was just. I mean, it's it's almost impossible to know what came first, isn't it? When we yeah. were children, nature, nurture. I have no idea, but I have been told all of my life you know from I was Diddy people who knew me from I was born and then knew me as I grew up and they always said the same thing that I was just like this sunny little thing that just it seemed to uh things just seemed to roll off me like it yeah. didn't like bad things didn't stick um I need to take Sue with me to Norway. I would, it's true. I would <laughs> love to go. I've never been, and I would really love to go. Really love you to go. Take Let's me to do South it. Africa, and I will take you to Norway. Deal. Deal. We're um, like virtually shaking on it. <laughs> yes, thank you. But yeah, I think I think I've always um, I have always had an attitude of uh, that. First of all, everything will be okay eventually. I, I used to get bullied for being naive, actually. That used to be a thing I used to get bullied for. And no. it's like such a nuts thing. Like, why would you, why is this a bad thing that you think the best of people? This should be a good quality, right? So, so it wasn't always easy growing up being very extra and very sunny and very kind of, I was that annoying positive person that people probably wanted to punch. That was me. Um, <laughs> But later in life, I think, you know, that has, I've been allowed to just be that and not yeah. have to apologize for who I am. And that's been really liberating. And especially now that I'm, that I'm mature um, and I have kids myself, I encourage their originality, their yeah. being extra, their being, you know, positive little sunny beings. Um, 
And the, the, it's really funny because they are awfully similar to me, my kids. Yeah. <laughs> Which is really funny. So I get that, you know, in return. I and uh, your mum was just saying that you were like that as a kid and as an adult, optimistic. And um, I think that, you know, I haven't known you, didn't know you as a child, but I can certainly vouch for that as an adult. Uh, <laughs> What do you do when you're between acting gigs, like to stay positive and to stay kind of mentally in good shape? Well, I, I, um, I have gotten into what you call personal development, but I mean, that's such a broad term and it sounds very kind of, but um, <laughs> I, I, read, <laughs> I read a lot of books about mindset. I listen to a lot of audios. Um, I have a lot of amazing friends who are authors as well, so so I get to read their things, um, and I, I, I'm always trying to learn and grow as a human being uh, and evolving. But I, I guess that's how I stay positive. And also, I have a a business which keeps my mind sharp as well. So I'm not. Yeah. I always have something to do because if I don't have something to do it gives me great sadness. So I, I, I have to be busy. Um, mm. And I think we're quite similar, uh, where we just have to be busy. So I do that. And sometimes I play songs and sometimes, you know, and I, I, I keep my hands in very many pies. And at the moment, I'm trying to set up a home studio for voiceover work at home. I'm having a gaming reel made. I'm a member of the voiceover network. Um, so I do workshops and I have my album business, but, but the whole mindset thing, that was something I wish I'd known about earlier. You know, I wish I had known how it's not woo-woo or weird to want to work on yourself and to want to improve your mindset. It's yeah. a good thing. Uh, and I wish I kind of understood that earlier because I have, you know, read and listened to some extraordinary writers and, um, uh, and it's helping me in my little life and staying, staying um, strong in, in difficult circumstances like now. Someone's knocking on the door. Hello? Your family is saying, please come back to us. You can sit in silence. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. I, to you. I, I told someone. you she was coming Dad in. Dad would have stopped tickling me. It was getting annoying. <laughs> Dad, all right. Wait, I promise we won't keep you. We've got two more questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Should be my quiet final, my, actually, my final question, and then there's sort of a couple of questions from, from people who wrote in. But my final question is, what is your dream role now? Um, your Ooh. dream role or dream show? And they don't have to be the same. Oh, very exciting. <laughs> hmm. What my dream role be? Or what was I thinking about? I had something the other day where I really was thinking about my dream. Well, first of all, I would say that my absolute ultimate dream would be to be an original Disney voice in an original animated movie. Uh, Great. Preferably the lead character who gets to sing. That would be so fun. Uh, but yeah, I would just love to do more of that. I, I, feel very much at home in that universe um and i want to do i want to do it for my door the cat came uh everyone's coming in here yes um, everyone wants a bit of the action they do. Uh, i want to do i want to do a really cool video game that would be super fun to be mm -hmm. to be doing that i would also love to do um the play uh um, a Doll's House before I'm too old. I would love to play Nora in that. I've loved that play ever since I was a child. Uh, and it's a role I feel like I would do very well. Um, and a role that I feel like I could, you know, I could give it my all. Yeah. Um, but also, oh, there's so much, like uh, I, was, I was on Netflix the other day and there are so many creators I would love to work with. Too many to mention. Um, but, I mean, it's unlimited, isn't it? I could literally yeah. say, <laughs> pie in the sky, anything. I just, uh, I just love working. Yeah, I just wondered if there was that one thing, you know, like Norma Desmond or like, is there, do you have that one kind of like, I want to play this. 
Uh, <laughs> but no, I think what you give, I think a Disney, an original Disney voice in a new that's, that's Disney the film. Thing is that, yeah, that's yeah. the big thing is, yeah. So just before we let you go, some people have um, sent some questions in. The first one is, would you ever do a concert in London? Yeah, I'd love to do that. <laughs> right, well, there you go. Coming soon to a theatre near you when we can get back to theatres. <laughs> uh, how does it feel to be a Disney queen? Oh, amazing. I love it. And if I, we were talking about this because you're a goddess. Because <laughs> you have to correct me because I called you a queen. So you're a goddess. And I'm a queen and fifth spirit. Yes. And the universe. <laughs> I know. I mean, honey, together we could do anything. <laughs> well, like the Milky Way. Yeah. <laughs> I quite like, too, that our earthly forms, you're a frog and I'm a cow. <laughs> <laughs> Is she a cow in her earthly form? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't so happy about that, but yeah. <laughs> but hey, you're cuter cow than I was a frog. <laughs> oh, it's too funny. Um, somebody's asked how we know each other, but we've answered that. So uh, what musical have you not done yet that you would love to do? Ooh. Well, you said, I mean, Sunset Boulevard is one of my favorite shows, actually. Yeah. But, I mean, I love everything by Sondheim. Um, I'm loving some of the new musical theater writing that's coming out, you know, as well. Like, my daughter's had me listening to Six, the musical. I think it's amazing. Oh, it's great. It's I love great. it. I love yeah. it. So, you know, things like that. Well, I'm too old to play <laughs> in it, but I love listening yes. to it. We're but, both too old to play in it. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. I'd love to play Wicked. I might be too old. I don't know. Um, that would be so fun to be Alphaba. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Why not? No, you're not too old. She's supposed to be, she's supposed to be a high school student. So, she's I mean. Green. Nobody can tell. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I'll be like this. Um, uh, no, I think it'll be great. Fun. Sorry, something just flown into my eye. Oh, my goodness. Anyway. <laughs> um, and my final yeah. question, lovely Lisa, is what is your favorite song from Frozen 1 or 2? And would you sing us a little bit from it, please? Oh, my gosh. And that is from a Norwegian fan, so you have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> You've been right. Like, so Frozen 1, obviously, my favorite song in there is Let It Go. I mean, how could it not be? My favorite song though in Frozen 2 is probably Show Yourself. I was really surprised that that wasn't the Oscar nominated song in a way, because yeah. to me it was definitely, I love Into the Unknown, but I think Show Yourself is an even more epic, stronger number, but maybe it gave away the stories too much. So, uh, but Show Yourself is almost harder to sing live without the orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll do a bit from Into the Unknown. Shall I do that? I'll give Whatever, you, you, like. Whatever um, you like. Um, I can hear you, but I won't. Some look for trouble while others don't. There's a thousand reasons I should go about my day and ignore your whispers, which I wish would go away. Oh, whoa. Um, not you're not a voice. <laughs> <laughs> you're just ringing it's like, and let me, let me go later in the song we can go okay. later in the song into the unknown into the unknown into the unknown <laughs> I got your chorus over here <laughs> I'm literally massaging her feet as we speak. <laughs> that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. And I think on that note, we will say good night. I see somebody asked a question about why you didn't do the English dub. Uh, and that is probably, I imagine, because the English dub is a deep as well. I don't need a dub in England. Um, but, I think uh, she'd be quite offended if it was like, this an English dub from Norway. Um, Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you, Tallulah, for showing us your feet and for popping in. I'll do whatever you want. 
And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this two-hour almost interview, a marathon chat with Lisa. <laughs> thank you uh, so much, Suanne. You're just an amazing goddess. And don't you guys think that me and Suanne should do a concert together? I think that would be a hoot. Yes. That's what we do. Me, you, and London together. A queen and a goddess. It could only be fun, right? Let's do it. Let's do it. 2021, baby. I'm 2021, so there for that. Um, Love and you. Thank you so much, up, you guys. Oh, thank you. This will be up on my YouTube channel tomorrow, um, which I'll send you the link if you wanted to share it on your YouTube for, for all your fans and everything. And thank you very much again for spending your evening with me. I can't wait to see you in person and give you a proper hug. Um, but this has been glorious in the meanwhile. <laughs> I love you so much. You're the best. Thank you, my darling. You. Have a good night. Everyone, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you may be. Thank you so much for joining us. I will see you uh, next week. I'll be here again. Save time, save place. Uh, next week, my guest is Kai Owen, um, and I can't wait to chat. We're going to be talking all things sci-fi and all sorts of other wonderful things. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night. Mwah.